Hello and welcome to the final chapter in the Bankers Leadership Series in association with Walters Kluwer looking at the data challenges faced by financial firms when addressing complex and changing regulatory reporting requirements. The series of discussions are based on a recent survey conducted by the banker benchmarking more than 100 financial institutions' data readiness for regulatory reporting and compliance. Um, I'm going to ask this question to Rajat. Uh, how do you think that organizations can best meet the complex regulatory requirements at local, regional and global levels um, to really get out in front of the stringent reporting requirements that are being asked of them? It is making sure that one gets the right data to be able to comply, understand the bank's risks and to comply with the reporting requirements. So the data we spoke about data, I think getting good high quality data is an issue and, uh, and investments happening there. In parallel, I, I cannot uh, stress more the importance of using the data to actually run the businesses of the bank. I think that is critical. That is where there's value for the banks. And investments coming in, we are seeing, when we are talking to our clients, and we have clients across all regions, and, and clients are asking for tools to, how can they use this information? That is an area where investment's coming in. The only way they can do that is with what we discussed uh, in the last chapter, which was getting an integrated solution set. When they get the integrated set of uh, data across their businesses, they can then see where, where the risks might be, and then they can act, banks can act on this. To, so to summarize, getting right quality data, making sure that it is integrated data, making sure there are taxonomies that uh, the different uh, businesses and divisions agree, and using that for, for running their businesses. You know, it's, uh, we, it, there's a slide that I often use when we are presenting some of our solutions. We have a solution called Business Analytics which provides clients with this. It's a slide which is a car where you see a, the rear view mirror, you see the dashboard and the road ahead. Most of the activity now is looking in the rear view mirror most of the data, then they don't, sometimes they produce dashboards of their business, but very rarely, very few clients are actually looking ahead as to how they can use uh, this information. So this is, th this is what they need to do to get in front of, uh, to answer your question specifically, to get in front of what is really being asked of, mm. of them. Okay, um, I'm going to come back to the points that you've made there, but I'm wondering, you know, when you're thinking about trying to address that legacy technology challenge, you know, are banks such as City or Standard Chartered really looking at the software as a service model versus an on-premise model for regulatory compliance? Are you looking, you know, to sort of not really outsource, but sort of move some of the compliance to, uh, you know, technology that sits outside the firm? Yeah, so I think what we've been doing for years now is sort of scouting the market for fintech, regtech type of solutions that um, are scalable and are addressing the need of the organization and are also not so siloed and small that it would require us onboarding mm. hundreds of different fintechs or regtechs because I think that is an operational risk in its own right. Um, I think we haven't gotten to the answer. But we've seen a lot of potentially amazing things. Um, and I myself personally, with my engagement with the market, trying to sometimes bring certain firms together so they can actually create a more holistic solution from data cleansing to data security to cryptography to data travel. Um, so that once you create that sort of ecosystem of solution, it's much easier for a large organization to then plug that in. But I think what is most important is actually only the organization itself understands its data challenge, its business challenge, and the regulatory reporting and regulatory compliance challenge. So it's not as easy as just plugging in something from the outside. Mm. It needs to be an iterative engagement process and sometimes even sort of, you know, integrating a solution into a specific workflow that performs a very specific task. For example, as we see in email screening and, and solutions like that. So it is not very trivial. It requires a lot more thought and it's, it's, it's far beyond the initial sort of fintech, regtech excitement. It, it's then how you translate that into the organization that is already, as we discussed, a complex IT infrastructure that does require itself some overhauling. Yeah. Richard? Yes, I, I, I think broadly um, a, a similar response. I, I don't, in the near term, believe that we will 
um, move towards a any kind of uh, managed service model. Um, we've invested so much in, in our own people and systems and, and, and architecture. It would almost seem like taking a step back. Um, we've, we, our compliance costs, our regulatory costs increased 15% in 2017 compared to 2016. Um, so the, the, we have made that very significant investment. I think we, there is an opportunity for us to, to, to do a lot of rationalisation and improve the efficiency of our, our data and our systems and our processes. And that's what I, I think once we have a, once we're closer to the end state in terms of the regulatory landscape, I think we will, uh, along with many of our peers, be looking to ensure that our systems and processes are operating as, as, as efficiently as possible. Um, it may be that over time we, we may outsource some of these services, um, but I think we, we would do that um, where the provider is able to provide some unique service uh, or, or something in addition that, that, that perhaps we don't have. So, for instance, if we're thinking about something like credit risk modelling uh, and perhaps using new forms of credit risk data um, or, or analysis or information gathered by social media, uh, perhaps if that's some, that, a capability not in-house currently, we may... Um, seek to, to utilize the, those that data those, those services um, but in in the near term near term i don't think necessarily we, we would go that route i can imagine that for smaller firms and, and medium firms perhaps that that might be an attractive option uh, because they the 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 the, the, the kind of disproportionate nature to some extent of the regulatory landscape means that um, for them to replicate the kind of infrastructure that the large banks have is, is just too punitive. And so that, that's probably a, where we will see such models being adopted going forward. And Rajat, from your position in the market, and you know, do you see you know, that exploring the software as a service model uh, becoming a trend? A um, couple of things that we're seeing. Um, the first is to the point I think uh, Richard mentioned, which is the cost of regulatory compliance has gone up a lot. Now, for some of these large institutions, they have the capabilities and the infrastructure, they've put it there, and they, and, and, uh, they are leveraging that. What we are seeing is, for many of the other organizations, particularly if you go down the tier two, tier three, four, uh, four banks, they are not being able to, they need to find a solution which will A, be efficient, B, can respond quickly to new reports and new regulatory demands that come through. Also, the, the ability to, to not just do the reports but meet with all the regulatory pressures and penalties of non-compliance. They are the ones who are actually looking at, at SAS to start with. If you take a step back, and, and Ruth mentioned, the, the banking industry has been talking about cloud and SaaS-based mm -hmm. solutions for about 10 years now. We really haven't seen the big institutions move there as yet. That trend we are beginning to see now. Over the last year or so, we are seeing not just regulators encouraging this. We respond to a lot of RFPs for these capabilities. And virtually every RFP has a section on SaaS capabilities. And, and we've been told by some of the clients who we, we discussed this with, if, if a solution provider does not have a SaaS capability, that is, that is a, it's unlikely that the solution provider will be mm. selected. Yes, banks are not ready to move as yet, and it's happening slowly, um, but this is a core part of a capability set that banks are looking for, and I think it's over time that this, is, this will gain, it'll gain momentum more from a cost management and a speed to market perspective. Okay, and now I'm gonna come back to your original point about looking into the, um, you know, looking through the windshield instead of looking in the rear view mirror. What do you think is going to be the next big regulatory compliance issue? Where will it arise from? Um, and how will banks, you know, prepare themselves for that? I think it's just getting on top of what they have to do. And I think that the results of the survey uh, show very clearly that a lot of institutions are fundamentally struggling with that. Uh, they're struggling at multiple levels, but they're struggling particularly in terms of understanding uh, the constraints of the data that they face, the constraints of the technology, and the constraints of how they've been used historically. And I love the analogy of the, the rearview mirror because a lot of people's thinking on this is driven by what they've been doing, not what they see they will need to do in future by looking at the road in front of them too. Uh, continue the analogy. But I'd go to um, uh, Ruth's comments earlier about uh, two points. First is scalability. 
and second is uh, really the one about um, the availability of these things in the market and what's going to enable the availability of these things in the market, which is the open source nature mm. of the systems that are being developed, which is then dependent on what Richard was talking about earlier, which is the standardization. So all these things roll in together. To me, the crucial point is that there are very few institutions, although from uh, Roots and Richard's descriptions, there's the two that are doing it, very few institutions are sitting back and looking at this saying strategically, what is it that we do? What are we? Therefore, what can we not be and still fulfill our fundamental purpose? And that really defines that which you can outsource or that for which you can use an external provider. And I think as we, we crack the standardization problem, and I agree with Rajat's analysis earlier, it is, it's a, you know, we're, we're on a path, we're not at a, a final point yet, we're moving through an evolutionary process. But institutions, each and every institution, will need to address that issue strategically for themselves. The answer will differ, depending both on history and capability, but ultimately every single institution needs to address that, every single institution needs to solve their understanding of that for themselves, and that will result ultimately in an awful lot being pulled in off other providers through cloud technology. We've had so much that's been implemented that's supposed to fix the, the problems highlighted by the crisis, um, from capital liquidity, leverage requirements, um, focus on risk. Um, we talked about data and, 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 and regulatory reporting. We have to report so much more than we used to. Um, and um, I think that the bar is, is continuously raising. So that what might have been acceptable practice 10 or 20 years ago um, is no longer the case. And, and I'm sure that will, will continue. So for us, uh, uh, for, for the industry, we, we need to, 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 to maintain our vigilance and ensure that we're continually uh, responding to, to external demands, the, the regulatory pressures. Um, but I'd like to see a, a period of, um, a period so that we can reflect uh, and I'm not just saying the banking industry, but also the, the regulatory community, so we can take stock of, of what's been achieved. Um, and, and then we'll see when the next financial crisis comes, we'll see whether, um, I mean, I talked about prudential standards, but also recovery and resolution planning. Will those, those various mechanisms that have been developed at, at great cost, um, um, will they be adequate to ensure that banks are able to withstand um, the, the, the next crisis? And maybe just to add, I think we are now moving into a phase where the question is how can we take risks again in, in a controllable way? How can we use technology and data to be able to assess the risk properly so that we don't need to end up with only standardized models that presume an incapability of managing risk, but we can actually move back to a granular risk-based approach that truly reflects the risk because we have the data and we've done our analytics on it. We haven't maybe done it before the crisis because we all pretended we know the risk, but it wasn't actually true. I think now the technology and how we integrate it actually puts us in a position where we can do that. And I think then translating that back to the regulator to say, this is how we are able to take more risk. So we don't need to only cut cost, but we can actually run a business in the way it should be run, which always has involved risk and will always involve risk. Excellent. Well, I'd just like to thank you all for your contributions. I thought it was a very interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.